Well, welcome to Family Church. I am so glad you can join wherever you're watching from that you can be a part of a message today. Uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to get to speak to you today. My name is Pastor Craig, and um, I wanted to first get you to grab your Bibles, if you would, if you have one at your house or open up your app, whatever it is, wherever you're sitting. Um, I wanted to first just point out a couple of things if you're new to Family Church. One is that we believe that the Bible is God's Word, and we believe it is truth and accurate. And so as we read from this, as we study from this, we believe this is the direction that God has given us to know Him better and serve Him. Also, I think it's important that you know we believe that Jesus is the only way of salvation. And back in December, you might remember a holiday called Christmas. And many people observe Christmas, but there's a, a key reason why we did that. And that was to, to remember the coming of Jesus, the birth of Jesus. We also do that, and there's this word that is used, and the word is Emmanuel. And that word means God is with us. And we believe that when Jesus came, he was God in the flesh. And so today we are laying out an Easter series called God on Trial. And so today I'm going to focus sort of on the entry as Jesus enters into Jerusalem. And I know some of you are going, well, wait, it's not Palm Sunday. Well, I'm going to prepare you for Palm Sunday. It's a little different. So that's our first step. Then on Palm Sunday, we're going to actually go in and, and really focus on the trial, what it must have been like to have been Jesus on trial, to be God on trial. And then, of course, Easter, we're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate the resurrection and the power of Christ on display. So as we get going today, I hope that you can get a picture that this Easter time is not just uh, an, a bunnies and egg and candy kind of day. This Easter celebration is an amazing glimpse at the power of God on display for the world to see. So as we get into it today, I want to focus on a key idea of the message today is about this contrasting kings. And if you're not sure about contrasting, I used to do a lot of artwork, and, and contrasting, sometimes colors are in contrast. There's an obvious difference. When you put red and green together, they just kind of clash. There's difference to them. We're going to use that idea that Jesus, he was in a one view to the Jews, very different than the view that he came to portray. And so it starts this way in a picture that looks like this. If you know anything about magic eye art, you know that this picture at the surface is not what's deeper embedded in. And I'm going to pause and give you a chance to look at it for those of you who understand the magic eye art and see if you can find a solution I understand if you have astigmatism, this isn't going to work. And if you're somewhere right looking at your screen and your nose is touching the screen, it's really awkward. Well, that's enough time, and you're probably going, wait a minute, I didn't see it. Well, let me tell you about magic eye art in my life. Magic eye art, actually, I'm going to keep that up. I'm sorry, let me go back. Magic eye art, to me, was really ugly. Back in the 90s when this first came out, I remember we were in the mall, and we were walking, and on the wall at this art exhibit were these magic eye arts and picture frames, and I thought, this stuff is ugly, and people were looking at it and going, oh, look at that, and I thought, this is so foolish. All I see is a jumbled mess. It looks like the screen is out of whack on a TV, and I also remember my wife and some friends of ours went up, and they understood what magic eye art was, but I did not. See, I didn't realize there was a purpose to the art. I saw the art on the, for its surface, and it was ugly. And then all of a sudden, they go, oh, check it out. There's a, a UFO. And I'm looking at it, and I can't see it. And I just thought, I'm such a doofus. I don't see it, you guys. And they're like, no. And, I'm, and at that point, I'm getting frustrated because we're moving down the line, and they keep shouting out these things they're seeing. And I, I'm thinking, this is a joke. This is the biggest gag. And somehow, I missed it. And then some other people show up who weren't even part of our group, and they start saying the same thing. Oh, look, a UFO and, and whatever else. And I just thought, I hate this stuff. I can't figure it out. And I thought the whole time was just a gag against me. And somehow they got everybody into it. So I was looking around for, where's the, where's the hidden camera, right? Who's, who's punking me right now? <laughs> well, I left that very frustrated, and eventually I learned how to solve the magic eye art problem. But let's use that today and, and parallel this with the Jesus we're going to talk about. The Jesus the Jews saw and desired, 
and the Jesus that really came. And we're going to look at those together. So if you want to open up your Bibles, I'm going to read them on the screen, but we're in John chapter 12, and I'm going to start in verse 12, just a short section, and look at what was happening as Jesus is entering into Jerusalem. He's now been doing ministry. He's been, you know, healing the sick. He raised Lazarus from the dead. A lot of things have been happening as Jesus has been displaying his power and who he is. And uh, here's what they said. It says, the next day, the crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Jesus enters in not on a triumphant white steed, but on a lowly donkey's colt. And they shout to him, Hosanna, which is really at the heart. It says, God, save us. Please save us. They were waiting in anticipation for this day. But they had a picture, and it wasn't a wrong picture. Sometimes we, you know, we get like, oh, I can't believe they didn't see it. But they had the right motivations and the right reasons. They expected this, that the king of Israel was arriving. Now, in a funny twist, that's true. It was the king of Israel. But it was more than that. And so why would they think this, though? As they shouted Hosanna, there's, there's things they understood. As they looked back at the text for hundreds of years, they were wondering, when would this Messiah show up? When would this king show up? Look what it says in Zechariah. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. This is a book they would have known about. They would have read this. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the fowl of a donkey. In expectation, Jesus was fulfilling what was written hundreds of years previously. This prophecy was coming true, and they had every right to believe it, every right to expect this. Why? Because they were God's chosen people. These were, these were the Jews, God's chosen people. They've been kicked out of their land and returned and kicked out again. The Babylonians took them over, the Syrians. All of this had been going on for hundreds of years, and they find themselves under the role of the Roman emperor and this Roman power. And again, they're not free. And they thought, this is it, the king of Israel. The king of Israel is coming. But see, what they wanted was an earthly king. That's no different than me. I want, I want that. But they had the wrong perspective. If you look deeper into the story and you look deeper at the prophecy and you start to realize what was coming was the king of kings. More than the king of a nation, more than the king of Israel, this was the king of the universe. This is the king of all kings, the only king, <laughs> the final king, the supreme king. But the problem is that when he came in, it wasn't on the, the white horse with the large army. He was on a donkey and he kind of comes in and there's confusion, I think. I can understand that. I think we sometimes give the people of that time a hard time. Like, don't you see it? Well, yeah, they see what they expected. But look what it says in John. It says, no one takes it from me, this is Jesus speaking, but I, I lay it down of my own accord. I lay my life down. I don't come in to take over. I come in to submit. I lay my life down. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. I came with a different authority than you were expecting. I came with authority that's going to be eternal. This isn't about your, your present circumstances as a nation. This is about your eternal circumstances that are in jeopardy. I came because I desired deep relationship with you, and I wanted not just to save the Jewish people. I came to save the world. So the question I want to start with is this. Ask yourself, have I surrendered to the authority of Jesus? What I mean by that is, have I surrendered to this authority that says, 
I can't do this anymore. I can't earn my way to be with you, God. And, and Jesus makes this clear, by the way. If you're new to watching this, he says, look, I'm the only way, I'm the only truth. There is no life except through me. You want to have peace in your life. You want to have um, things go your way, but I came because I want it to be my way. I want you to follow my way. I came to prove to you that I love you. This last series we just finished about unity, the purpose of Jesus' arrival was to show the world that God loves them, to show. So have I surrendered to that authority? Am I trusting that God is who he says he is? Because he, he has authority. Am I, am I surrendering to the authority that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life? Have I given my heart in such a way where I will call him Lord and Savior? It's an important time to evaluate that as we look at the story of Easter because that is the message of hope is arriving on a donkey, on the cult of a donkey. The second thing that was shouted, right? Here he is, palm branches waving. There's this celebration in the streets and they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And there's this picture of a lion, right? Because they expected the lion of the tribe of Judah to bring blessing and majesty and divine protection. They expected this was coming. And it was. That's the irony of this. This is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's not going to perform the way they think, though, in might. See, he comes with power. There's a promise of power. Jesus arrives, but it's not the power that they thought. See, I think some of the Jews, from the reading I've done, they were willing to fight Rome if necessary. And perhaps that this is the king some of them expected would come and lead them into battle. But the reality is that there's about 2,000, it would take like 2,000 Roman soldiers uh, or you know, people around to fight 2,000 Roman soldiers. So you're going to have to have a pretty good army together to beat these highly trained professional warriors. And then if you did subdue this little town as he enters Jerusalem, if you, if you subdue that town, you still have all of the region to take over too. He didn't show up with might and strength and power the way they thought because what they wanted was control in a region, not worldwide control, not world conquering. They wanted to conquer this nation, perhaps, this, this smaller area. Listen to what it, what it says here, and this is really an important thing, because Jesus, he goes in, he's doing his teaching in the synagogues, and he opens a scroll, right? This scroll comes, and he reads this. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And he continues, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set oppressed free, to pro proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Like, those are good things. He's here. Awesome. We're going to be free. These are the things they've been waiting for. The blind can see, and the oppressed are no more, and there's freedom. And then he does this. He rolls up the scroll, hands it to them, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled at your hearing scroll drop. <laughs> Imagine. Today, these things you've been reading for hundreds of years that I just read to you, that's me. It's fulfilled. The prophecy today is fulfilled, but he would fulfill it in a different way. Not with might, but with meekness. You're, so you're saying this, you're going to come and take over, but we don't see the army. Look, we're, working, we're looking for peace here, Jesus. We're looking for control, authority. We want your power to reign here. And he says, it is. And it's going to, but not the way that you think. He said, I love this, uh, this definition of meekness is power under control. He has all the power, but he's going to control it the way he wants. And Pastor Paul shared this insight. I just thought it was cool. 
Like here's this story. If you're familiar with the story of Jesus, they go into the garden the night before his betrayal, right? During this event, all these soldiers come in and then they're trying to get him and Peter, one of his disciples, grabs a sword and is like, he's ready to just attack. Wow, use his might. And he, you know, lops off the ear of one of the soldiers. And then Jesus, instead of going, yeah, right on, everybody attack. He goes, oh, hold on, hold on. And he grabs this ear, we're told, and he places it back on the soldier and heals him. Uh, That's a pretty good display of power. But he doesn't use it to stop the events that have to take place. He uses it to prove who he is yet again, but then in his meekness say, this must happen. What's coming has to happen. There is no denying it. There is no stopping it. I have to do it. In fact, he says it this way in Mark. He says, he began to teach them the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. How much power does it take to rise yourself from the grave to be raised up? I don't have that power. (laughs) God has that power. And he proves that. And so here's Jesus. Not the lion, although he is, he's not the lion they wanted who would come in strength and might, but he's the meek, humble lamb. The lamb of God, we're told. And it says, for many of you know, to take away the sins of the world. He's not here to overcome a political enemy. He was here to beat a spiritual enemy. So the question two, where do I need the power of Jesus in my life? You might ask it lots of ways. Where am I trusting the power? Where am I seeing it active in my life? I realize something about the power of Christ in my life. Since I can't see to the future, I don't know what God's going to do in my life. I don't know how he's going to use that power. And oftentimes in my present experience, I'm oblivious to the power of God because like a frog in slowly warming up water, things are changing, but I don't notice it. But when I look back in my life, I go, look at the power of God on display. Look at how he called me. Look at how he changed my thoughts here. And as I trusted him more for his power, as I surrendered my life to Jesus for salvation, he goes, cool, welcome to the family. Let's get to work. And I look back and I go, and there he was, and there he was, and there he, look at the power involved in my life. I can't believe how much he's been active in my life, in my heart. I can't believe it. So where do you, See the power. Where do you need the power of Jesus in your life? Just so you're clear, I need the power tomorrow too. There is no arrival here. It's not as if I go, oh, fantastic. Everything is just perfectly lined up. God is just, whew, it's so easy now following Jesus. No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that I depend on his power every day to help me because my sinful heart wants the things of the world really bad. If I'm honest, I want to do exactly what I want to do every day. But I need that reminder. Oh, yeah. I need Jesus. He's more interested in my eternal than my external. Jesus is more interested in my eternal transformation, my dependence on him, the experience of his power, than the external changing of the surroundings. Yeah, he could. He could change everything around me. He could make me and the Israelites, the Jews of the time, he could have come in and said, poof, perfect, everything's good. It's going to be joyous for you. In fact, you're going to be in so much enjoyment right now and love it so much that you won't even need me. Oh, but that's not what I want. (laughs) I actually want you to depend on me. Not because it's an ego trip. It's because that's what a parent who loves his child does is be in relationship with me. Depend on me to love you too. I love you is what he would say. I need his power. The last thing they stated, and I just think this is such a powerful picture, not only a thorn of, a crown of thorns and a crown of gold is blessed as the king of Israel. He simultaneously wears these crowns. 
but the one on display was very different. There was a promise of peace. The Jews were looking to a promise of peace, and they were looking for this national conqueror. Come in and conquer this nation, Jesus. Show, bring that Messiah. We're ready. Conquer the nation. What we want is we want security. As you conquer the nation, then we'll experience security. That's what they're expecting, right? As you conquer it, we'll have serenity. It'll be awesome because all the bad people that are in this government in this, at this time of the Roman emperor, all that, they'll be wiped out. They'll no longer have power over us. We'll be restored into our natural setting, what we were called to. It'll be awesome. We've been waiting for like 900 years for this. Come on. We want prosperity. Oh, we just want to have, you know, the land to grow the things we love. And with your conquering of this nation, we can have that back. And we can have good meals and good times together and celebrations. And, but at the heart of that, what they don't realize is that's all temporary. Everybody that was around at that time of Jesus entering into Jerusalem, a uh, little bit of a spoiler alert, it's been like 2,000 years. They're not alive anymore. They don't, they don't get the, the benefits that they had wished for if it was only for that nation because their lives came and went, and so will mine and so will yours. You see, our life, no matter what we do, no matter what we ask for, for all of the things around us to be lined up to bring us peace and joy and serenity and all of these statements of security, all of those, eventually there is a day it won't matter because all those things will be gone. And I'll be left with one really important question. What about eternity? What does that look like now? It will be a sober day. Instead, here's what they expected. See, I keep pointing this out because it's not their fault. The Jewish people of the time, it's not the fault. Look at what they read in Zechariah. Again, it says, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. Now, remember, the whole earth to them was a lot smaller than it is to us these days. We have Google Earth. <laughs> we can spin it on our computer screens. But they were pretty confined. They didn't have that privilege. And then it says this, though. It, referring to Jerusalem, will be inhabited. Never again will it be destroyed. Jerusalem will be secure. They expected this security. What they don't think they realize is that's not for you yet. It's coming. And so instead, Jesus shows up to conquer sin and death. He comes in with a plan. Remember, this is a spiritual, a spiritual plan to take over sin and death. And what does that mean? Sometimes if we just throw that word around, if you've been going to church long enough, yeah, he conquered sin and death. And we kind of throw that around real easily. But let's just try to make it real clear. The Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death. When I choose to do sinful things, things that are in opposition of God. God is love, so when I hate, I'm in opposition of him. That is sin. Hating, hating this person. When I, when I fight physically, when I steal, when I do things that are in opposition of an holy and honest and truthful God, those are sinful things. And God says, look, because of sin... You can't exist with me. See, I'm holy and perfect, God would say. My perfection it cannot allow your sin to be in my presence. It's not going to work out. He says, but I wanted to make a way for you to be back in relationship with me. So every time you sin, it's as if a barrier gets put between us, and I am unable to inhabit your space because if I do my holiness, honestly, it'll wipe you out. Remember, we were objects of his wrath. And sometimes we don't, I don't know that we quite understand that fully, but I kind of think of it like this idea. I don't view God as going around looking for the moment to squish people. I've got him. <laughs> done. I think that the wrath of God is the, the product of holiness. He says, look, I, I can't allow it to exist. 
we, I think we understand justice, that a good judge makes the right decisions, that if the person is guilty, their punishment is just, and God would say, my holiness is perfect. And if I were to let you dwell in my presence with your sin condition, it would wipe you out. You couldn't exist. The second piece of that was death. And this is hard for some people to swallow, but at the day where your earthly existence comes, you will have an eternity with God or separated from him forever. Eternity will exist beyond our earthly life, right? That Jesus, he says, look, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me, and I'm giving an opportunity. I came not to, to bring peace to your nation, but to bring peace into your life, to bring peace and restore relationship between you and the Father. And you can't get there any other way. So if you trust in me, I'm going to bring you into the family and adopt you and graft you in, and now here you are, part of the kingdom of God, forever, eternity, in presence with God, past the earthly life that you have now. And you get to experience it now, too, which is really cool. You get to experience what it's like to experience joy in the middle of difficult circumstances. When the nation around you isn't the way you thought it was going to be, you can still find joy. He says this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. I've overcome all this. When you trust me, you get to enjoy not only your earthly life with this new vision and new understanding of, of goodness and who I am and what I have for you, but you also no longer will experience eternal death separated from God in hell for eternity. That's what this is about. This Jesus came not just so that you and I would feel good today, but so that you and I would know that he loves us and that he has a place for us and that he desires a relationship with us and he conquered sin. He defeated and gave us a way to be white as snow, the, the scripture teaches, to be completely forgiven, completely forgiven and to experience life eternal with the Father as opposed to death eternal apart from him. So the question I have is, whose kingdom am I building? In light of that information, whose kingdom am I building? Am I, am I working hard to try to make the things around me line up in such a way that I'm happy, the right retirement, the right health, the right circumstances in my living quarters, wherever I, whatever that looks like, am I focused on that, building my kingdom, or am I surrendering to the king's kingdom, <laughs> right? Jason, last week, he underlined that idea. The whole point of a kingdom is there's a king, and either I can be the king of my kingdom, and it will be short-lived, by the way, because I'm a lousy king, <laughs> Because I change my mind a lot and I'm sinful and I just think it's all about me. And so I would railroad everybody. Get out of my way. The king's arrived. Here I am. I'm going to take, take control. Is that the kingdom I'm building? Push people out of the way who I disagree with so my kingdom can be happy. If, they, if we have a, a different view on something, just talk bad about them and Facebook them and tweet bad about them, whatever it is, so that I feel good in my kingdom. Or am I about being a part of the kingdom of God and trusting that Jesus will build his kingdom through me and in me and trusting that? Whew, that's a big question. It takes surrender and it takes trust and it takes a key word, faith. Faith. We're in the series of God on trial. Next week, we're going to look at Jesus on trial. And evaluate, what must it have been like? You see, here's what the trial is about. Look at the scripture here. John 10 says this. These are, you know, the, the religious leaders of the day. They said this, we are not stoning you, Jesus, you, for any good work. They've seen it. They've seen the miracles. They've heard about it. We're not stoning you for those things, they replied, but for blasphemy. Because you, a mere man, claim to be God. God is on trial. 
Eventually, I solved these stupid magic eye pictures. Sorry if you love them. It drove me nuts. Eventually, I was able to manipulate whatever the, it is about your eyes that happen, and you cross them, and you pat your head and rub your stomach. I finally figured out how to do it, and, and you know what? I saw the things that people were seeing, and I, and I think that in this, in this picture, people then began to see who Jesus was. And if you couldn't solve this, I couldn't find the answer for you. But if you did and you saw Jesus on a cross, that's what this picture is embedded inside. There is actually a purpose to this picture. And it's not easily seen at first. Look what it says about the disciples too. I love this. At first, His disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize these things had been written about him and these things had been done to him. Remember I said, when you're in the moment, sometimes it's hard to see what's going on. It's true. Like, I don't think we ever arrive at fully understanding who God is. And if you have, congratulations. That's an amazing thing to have full knowledge and understanding of God. These disciples, they were watching and this is new, and, and they're trying to figure it out, and eventually they go, I get it. And I think, like me, they looked back in their life and their time with Jesus and said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, he, he is active, and he does have authority, and he does have power, and he does bring peace. He does all these things because he loves us. We are always in a constant, hopefully, a constant progression of understanding God just a little bit more of looking a little deeper into his word, pressing into our relationship and seeing him just a little more clearly for who he really is. I hope that today, as we begin this process of preparing for Easter, I hope this gives you a better picture, at least a beginning of this this picture of who Jesus is and what he has accomplished. I'm gonna pass off to the campus pastors and if you're online, have a little closing for you. Thank you so much for joining us today.